afternoon and welcome. My name is Claire Varesio and I am the community librarian at Cupertino Library. I'm so happy to have you join us today for this last wellness program of 2019 and we're looking forward to continuing the series in 2020. Today's wellness program is an introduction to herbalism and it's brought to you today with support from Cupertino Library Foundation. Our speaker today is Finn Oaks. Finn Oaks is a writer, educator, and clinical herbalist who is a graduate of the Blue Otter School of Herbal Medicine. Finn is also co-owner of Steadfast Herbs, a small herb farm located in Pescadero, California that provides local herbs, seedlings, and herbal medicine to the greater Bay Area. In their clinical practice, Finn supports clients in their mental and emotional health with a focus on building resiliency to trauma. You can learn more about their practice at finnoaks.com, and I would like to welcome up Finn for today's program. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And if there's, if there's any point where you can't hear me, just raise your hand, and I'll speak a little louder. Um, I always start my workshops with saying that we're here to talk about health and wellness. So if you need to take care of your body in any way um, in the next hour and a half, if you need to drink water or use the bathroom or stretch, um, please do so. That is welcome, so please take care of your needs. Um, as Clara said, um, my name is Finn Oaks, and I'm involved in herbalism in two different ways right now. I co-run and um, co-farm a half acre in Pescadero called Steadfast Herbs. And a lot of folks are familiar with the local food movement, right? Like the idea that you're trying to source your food within, some people say, 100 miles um, in order to use less fossil fuels and support the local economy. And so we started this project really um, in response to that, to try to grow more herbal medicines for the Bay Area, um, because most herbs are actually imported from outside. Um, the United States, and that's mostly for labor costs. So there's herbs that are like really easy to grow here, um, that grow abundantly here in California or the US, and are imported from Bulgaria, or Morocco, or a lot of different places, just because it's easier for the, and cheaper for the larger companies to source that way. So we wanted to create, um, we wanted to create a source for herbs for other herbalists and for other people who use herbal medicine, that it's local to them. Um, we're not certified organic, but we use organic practices, and we're about five years into this business. So um, there's cards back there if you're interested. And then I also have a private practice, a clinical practice, where I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I create herbal formulas for them to meet their needs, and we meet about every six weeks. And um, I primarily work with like supporting folks on mental and emotional health, and as Claire said, on trauma resiliency. Um, and there are a number of uh, practitioners in the greater Bay Area, Bay Area. So if you're interested in working with an herbalist um, for more complicated conditions, um, I really encourage you to do that. There's something really profound in working with someone one-on-one -on -one and being witnessed in that way and being supported in that way. Um, I often like to tell my own sort of story of how I found herbalism. It was about 12 years ago, and I was like deeply impacted by chronic stress um, showing up mostly in my physiology. So this is something not a lot of people experience. I was, um, you know, had chronic insomnia. I was, had a lot of anxiety, like strong, um, uh, very easily startled, very depleted. Um, and that's something that, some, that a lot of people experience, both just because of like their work environment, um, because of caregiving, because of trying to survive under capitalism, because of structural oppression or interpersonal traumas. And what this means is that, um, try to not give too much physiology, but um, our bodies don't really know the difference between needing to run away from a bear and needing to run to catch the BART train, right? Like intellectually, we might understand that there's a distinction, but physiologically, stress hormone cascades happen, and what they're doing is that they're working on survival. So they're sending um, all the blood and all the energy to your extremities and to your heart, 
But then what gets neglected um, are other organ systems. So often digestion is impacted and immune systems are impacted and other things that aren't as necessary for survival. And so when people are in a chronic stress state, that's where those imbalances show up. And for steadfast herbs, we sell at farmer's markets a lot of the time. And that's a lot of what we're seeing, is people will come to us um, needing digestion support with insomnia, looking for help with stress and anxiety. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a chronic condition for a lot of people. But I was in that state. And so I started to work with an herbalist one-on-one. -on -one. And over about a course of a year, um, I saw a really profound change in terms of the way my nervous system was a lot more resilient and the way I felt a lot calmer in my day to day. So clearly that had a pretty big impact on me um, and an impact on my day to day. But the other thing what did is it just opened my eyes to this world of herbal medicine. I didn't grow up with plant medicine at all. Um, I was definitely given a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, and so I didn't even know that this was an option. And it was really empowering to start to learn about the plants and to start to learn the ways that I could treat myself. So I started to learn if I was feeling anxious, I could take this herb called skullcap. That was a scary name, but it's a very gentle plant. Um, I could take skullcap and I would start to feel calmer. I learned that if I was starting to get a cold or the flu, I would take echinacea or yarrow or a plant like that, and I would not get sick a lot of the time or it wouldn't last for as long. So the sense of agency that that gave me was really huge to know that I could have an impact on my body, I could have an impact on my mind um, and my overall health. And it, I just kind of fell in love with the plants too. I was doing a lot of gardening at that point and started to do urban farming and the medicinal plants were just the plants that I kept being drawn to. Um, so that was kind of how I got involved in herbalism and now it's what I do, like six plus days a week is what I do is work with these plants. And it feels like such an honor to be working with them. And it brings me such joy too, to be in relationships to these plants, especially working with other people too, and seeing, making that connection, helping them to find relationships to other plants too. So thank you for showing up today, for being open to learning about some plant medicines. Um, I also always like to, give some honor and respect to my teachers. I've had a number of teachers, but Karen Sanders and Sarah Holmes are the teachers who have really had the most profound impact on me and my practice. And they actually have a um, radio show that I like to tell folks about that's called The Herbal Highway. And it's on the, um, the Berkeley Public Radio Station, KPFA. It's on your yellow sheet um, if you picked up one of those handouts. But it was before the days of podcasts. They had this radio show that is also now in podcast form, um, format. But the incredible thing is that there's like a 20 year archive of these shows, it's once a week. Um, so there's a lot of really great free herbal education that's out there from Karen and Sarah. And um, two of my friends and colleagues, Emiliano Lemus and Rene Camilla uh, have also been co-hosting a lot and bringing in um, interviews with a lot of really great uh, younger herbalists too. So, if you're interested in herbal medicine, I definitely recommend listening to that show. Um, so what is herbalism? Herbalism is really just the practice of using plants for supporting mental, emotional, and physical health. And herbalism is something that like all peoples have practiced, right? Pharmaceuticals are pretty new. Um, and even at this point, 40% of pharmaceuticals are actually derived from plants. So you might be taking a, a form of plant medicine and not even know it. But every, every peoples, every culture have had a tradition of plant medicine um, using the herbs that grew around them in order to support uh, their health and well-being and the health of their community. So you might know the herbal tradition um, you might be like part of an intact cultural tradition where you know, like my grandma always made this tea and I make this tea to you, um, which is amazing if you are um, that connected to an herbal tradition. Or maybe it's a few generations back for you. But every culture and every place has had a relationship 
to the plants and have used plants for helping to support health and well-being. Um, in most culturals, in most ancestral cultural herbal traditions, food is usually the first place that practitioners will go. Um, so if someone's out of balance, they'll try to start with food to try to rebalance and support someone. And if the food isn't working, then go more towards more interventions of using medicinal plants. And I also, also often say that um, herbs are kind of on a, a spectrum, too, of things that are more food-like to things that are more pharmaceutical. So there are some herbs that you might actually eat or cook with, and there are some herbs that you could take as a tea, like every day, and it would be a tonic, it would be something that would um, be nutritive and help support you. And then there are some herbs on the spectrum that are really just for super acute situations that are a little more like drugs, um, like pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs, and that can actually be poisonous if you take them in the wrong dosage, right? So there's a big spectrum there, and when, if you're just starting to work with herbs, I would recommend working with the herbs that are a little more food-like or that you know are super safe and gentle. Um, let's see. So sometimes when I talk about pharmaceuticals, um, people feel like I might be anti-pharmaceutical or anti-allopathic or Western medicine, and I'm definitely not. I feel like the two can be complementary and that both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses. So if I you know, was in a car accident and I broke my leg, I would definitely go to the hospital to get my bone set. That's absolutely where I would go. Um, but if I had a cold and I, had, I thought it was probably like a viral cold, there's very few antiviral pharmaceuticals on the market. So I might turn more towards an antiviral plant. And the reason why there's antiviral properties inside of uh, plants is because they've had to find their own ways of defending against viruses and then we get to benefit from their intelligence and take that medicine into ourselves and defend ourselves against the viruses as well. Um, so, and also working with clients who are often on um, SSRIs or other forms of pharmaceuticals to support their mental health, I find that using both herbs um, and pharmaceuticals can be really supportive for folks. So I definitely don't feel like never take pharmaceuticals or over-the-counter drugs. I'm not a purist really in anything, um, but know that both can be used in concert where each is most appropriate or in combination too. Um, I, as much as possible, I usually like to try to bring the plants into the room so that you can have a sense of the plants themselves. So I organize a little bit of a slideshow of plants that I feel like are probably more familiar to you. These are plants that are either native to the Bay Area or, or have become naturalized here and are easy to find, or plants that grow often in folks' gardens. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about these plants and their uses. And we are gonna have Q&A at the end, so um, if one of these plants really sparks your curiosity and you have some questions, that's great. Just maybe save it to the end. Um, and we can address those questions now. So does anyone know what this plant is here? This slide? California puppy. Raise your hand if you knew that it was medicinal. Yeah, not a lot of folks. So California puppy is a plant where the whole plant is used. So the seeds and the flowers and the leaves and the stems and the root, all of it is used. And it's a really great anti-anxiety herb. It's also really great for insomnia. In higher doses, it's sedating. And in lower doses, it's more just calming. And it's one that you can even give to kids. Um, so it's really safe. It's not a, even though it has the word poppy in the name, it's not a true opiate. Um, it's a different family. The Schultzia californica is the name of, of the California poppy in Latin. And so this one can even be given to kids for hyperactivity um, or to adults as well who um, are struggle with ADD. 
And it's also one that's helpful for getting people um, a little more into their hearts. So for folks who live very much in their heads and maybe can kind of like spin out um, in their heads, that helps to ground people and it helps to get them a little more centered and a little more into their heart. And it's also just a really beautiful plant. So there's a lot of medicine just being around it and it's a really big pollinator. So all of these pictures that I'm showing are from our farm, from the Sedfast Herbs farm. And this is one that always have, we have beehives too, but there's always honeybees rolling around in the flowers as well as bumblebees too. And it's one that if you wanted to plant, it's really easy to start from seed, throw it in your garden, and then it'll self-seed too. So you'll have endless poppies once you first have them in your garden. This is photo of, does anyone know what plant this is? Yeah, these are dandelions, you know, which are often weeded out of people's lawns or seen as a weed. And the leaves are really super nutritious. They have a lot of vitamins and minerals. And then the roots are a really strong liver herb. So they're um, really good at detoxing and supporting the liver. And in Western herbalism, as well as I believe in TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, um, the way that a lot of conditions are treated is first through the liver. So skin conditions are treated through the liver, things like eczema or psoriasis, acne. Often if you get the liver into balance, it'll help with skin issues. Um, hormonal imbalances often are treated first because hormones are synthesized there in the liver. Um, allergies can be supported by supporting the liver. And also just since we live in an environment where there's a lot of toxins, I feel like kind of everybody needs some liver support too. So dandelion is one of those food herbs. It's one that you could use daily um, as a tea or a tincture, or as using it uh, in your food too. The dandelion greens are bitter, and bitters are also really, which is bitter is a flavor that's um, not often in diets, and it's really helpful for priming the digestion. So it gets all the enzymes like from your salivary glands, down into your stomach, ready to process food. So dandelion is a really powerful herb. And we actually have a really hard time growing this one, even though it's a weed, because the gophers love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's funny, it's like the most weed-like ones are the ones we struggle. And we ended up growing it in pots this year because the gophers would just eat all of them. I guess they needed some liver support too. <laughs> um, does anyone know what this photo is similar. Similar to ryegrass, it is oats or milky oats. And this is um, the kind that we cultivate as a Venus sativa. It's the same oats that you would eat in your oatmeal. Um, and around here, especially in the hills of the East Bay, but I think probably around here too, you often see wild oats growing. So there'll be like those long grasses like you see in the back um, that's kind of spread their seed in early summer when the dry season hits. And this is a really amazing nervous system tonic. So the grass, the stems, the oat straw, has a lot of vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And then the oat heads, um, there's a stage where they're milky, which is between when they flower and they go to seed. It has this like gooey latex inside. If you pop them, you can see the kind of ooze out. And this is amazing food for the brain. It's called a trophor restorative when there's, a, when there's an herb that acts like the food for a certain organ system. And this is the one for the nervous system. So it's really helpful with stress and anxiety and for helping people who are in depleted states too. Um, it's one that is gentle enough that you could give it to elders, you can give it to kids, you can give it to someone no matter what um, pharmaceuticals they might be on. The only thing is if someone has an oat allergy, they wouldn't want to use it. But otherwise, um, it's a really beautiful medicine. So those are, it's a picture of the oat heads have just been gathered when they're milky in that basket. And then you can see the straw in the back. And I think if you have this image in your mind, you might notice next summer 
the, it's, it's, kind, it's basically a weed around here. Um, when you see that tall grass, there's a good chance that's wild oats. Does anyone know what these might be? Yeah, elderberry. Sounds like folks are more familiar with elderberries. Um, elderberries are also um, kind of more on the food spectrum of medicinal plants, and they're really strongly antiviral. This is a great medicine for this time of year, for cold and flu season. Um, it's something you could take daily to make sure you don't get sick, or if you do get sick, it can help you to get over the cold or the flu faster. And elderberry, mm-hmm. Yeah, and these, um, this variety, Sambuca Mexicana, that is kind of blue and has this yeasty blush on it, this is the kind that's native to here, to California, to northern Mexico, California, up into Oregon, Washington. This is the kind of elderberry trees we have. And you'll often see them actually growing ar around the highways. Um, Highway 101, there's like huge stands of elderberry trees. They're also often in the Oakland Hills, you can find them. And they put out these beautiful white flowers in the spring and these berries in the summer. And you, but you don't, you only wanna use the berry, the stems and leaves and everything are a little bit toxic. Um, not like deadly toxic, just give you a stomach ache toxic. You still wanna avoid that. And I was generally trained um, not to wild harvest plants. So there's a little bit of a trend now of wild crafting, and it's used kind of as a selling point. If you go to Whole Foods or some other natural food store, you might see that an herb has been wild crafted. And I think the idea is if it's come from the wild, maybe um, it's more powerful for some reason because it's from the wild or it's less toxic. Um, but part of the reason, again, that we started the farm Steadfast was both to provide herbs for the Bay Area and also to have a source for folks where things weren't wildcrafted because often wildcrafting takes from the ecologies um, of an area and some plants have definitely been over harvested because they've become commercially viable. So people will go and dig them up in order to make a little cash but at the expense of stands. And there's also just like new herbalists who get really excited um, to be able to identify plants and then go and we'll take plants, but not really know like the health of the community, the health of the stands that they're harvesting from, and also not know whose plant medicine they might be taking from, right? So this can also be detrimental to communities who have been tending um, to plants maybe for generations, and someone isn't really paying attention to that and just comes in and says, oh, this is a medicinal plant, and takes that medicine. So that's a little bit of my wild crafting spiel is just to be aware of um, if you're buying things that are wild crafted to kind of check white sage is something that often you're seeing now wild crafted bundles for sale like at Walmart actually and Kmart um, and white sage is actually endangered it's an endangered plant and it's also a plant that's really important and sacred to a lot of native nations and communities in California so also just to be thinking about um, are you practicing cultural appropriation? Are you giving respect to the people whose medicine this is and where was this sourced? So that's information that a lot of people don't know about, but just to let you know um, as much as possible to support herbs that have been cultivated, maybe rather than wildcrafted, or to try to grow your, them yourself too. A lot of these plants are really easy to grow. This plant. This is, yeah, this is a kind of rose. It's a wild rose. Um, but all roses are really great medicine for heartache and grief. Um, they also help to get people a little bit more into their heart, and they're like a real good heart hold, too, for the heart. And this is a plant that often is growing in people's yards. Maybe not wild rose, but other forms, other varieties of roses are growing. And it's one that's nice to just spend some time with, too. So um, talk a little bit more about how you might use herbs in terms of how you might ingest them. But I think that herbs are really powerful, too, 
without having to take them into your body or consume them, just spending time with plants is really healing as well and building relationships with them. You know, there's that whole thing like stop and smell the roses, uh, which I think is actually really wise. And I think that plants can help to bring us into greater, um, greater presence and have greater attention too, which in this world is really, really needed and helpful in its own form of medicine. Uh, the whole rose, the whole the flower, mm -hmm. is the part that's used. And so, if you have a rose bush, you know maybe just spend a little time with it, or if your neighbor does, or if you're around roses, and just see, just pay attention to how you might feel physically, mentally, emotionally. Do you feel any kind of shift or any kind of adjustment when you're around the plant? And also just notice its scent, notice its color. Notice how this plant looks in different seasons. In the Bay Area, there's a much milder climate, so the plants, um, you don't see as many variations. But the rose will then become a rose hip, so it'll be like the little fruit of the rose plant. Um, and then all of that will fall away, too. So I think sometimes there's this expectation when people go to our farm that everything is always in full bloom all the time. Um, because those are like the pictures on like Instagram and social media and things like that um, are all of these full bloom. But the plants themselves um, have their own cycle and their own dormancy um, and all the many phases. And I think that that's something that we can learn from plants too. Um, the, seeds of, the seeds of the rose hips um, contain a lot of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you use the rose? Yeah, the rose hip. You can use it in teas. Yeah, and we can get into that more in a little bit too. Folks familiar with this plant? No? This one is thyme. The herb thyme, and it's in flower in this picture. And a lot of the herbs that culinary herbs, especially culinary herbs that um, come from European continent, are actually really antibacterial and really strongly antiviral, um, and sometimes antifungal as well. Antimicrobial is when they're all of those things. And, and they're used in cooking because they were acting as preservatives. So before refrigeration, People would use things like oregano and rosemary and thyme to kind of coat their, their meats, their vegetables to try to preserve them. So a lot of those plants are really helpful um, for if you're starting to get sick because they're so antimicrobial. And um, there's a really good book that I put on that resource list called The Herbal Kitchen by Cammie McBride. And it just has a lot of recipes with herbs that you might already have in your kitchen that you might already have in your spice cabinet or that are really easy to access. So thyme is especially really great for a sore throat, as is sage, too. Um, and so you could do like a tea, you could eat them, you could do a little bit of a like sore throat gargle, too. And you could use it fresh or dried. When you're looking for herbs um, in the supermarket or at a health food store, uh, if you're looking for dried herbs like thyme, for example, you just want to make sure that they still have a good strong smell and that they also um, have a good color. Because if herbs have been sitting around for a long time at a store, or like I'm saying, a lot of herbs are imported too, so if, they've been, if it's been a long time since they were harvested, um, and between then and the time that they get to the store, then they might have lose some of their potency. Um, so it's important to kind of look for what seems to be smelling good and tasting good and kind of go through your own herbs pretty often too. Ideally, they say ideally use your herbs within a year, but I think that's very rare um, and just kind of use your own judgment. Folks familiar with this plant? <coughs> the 
This is calendula, and it's an herb that you'll sometimes see in people's gardens. It's this bright orange color. Where we're growing it, sometimes it's yellow. And it's a plant that's really easy to grow from seed if you put seeds in the ground. When I was a garden educator, when I worked with kids, we'd plant this one a lot because it would grow so easily from seed and it'll make a ton of seeds. So once you plant it, it'll just um, keep planting itself. And this plant is really great. It's one of the best skin herbs that I know of. So it's one that's often in um, like lotions and creams. And we put it in salves. And salves are basically just like herb infused oils um, that have beeswax added to them so that they're a little bit thicker. And so this one is helpful for like eczema, psoriasis, dry skin. It's also a really good lymph tonic too. Good for lip balm, things like that. And it feels really nice too. So if you like rub a flower on your face, it feels really silky and soft. Um, and there's this concept in Western herbalism, it's called doctrine of signatures. And it's the thought that you can tell from the shape of the plant what it might help with for humans. So if something looks like heart-like, maybe it's helpful for the heart. And I've, I kind of adopt that a little bit more strongly, like how, what is the texture of it? How does it feel? And this one seems, it just seems like it would be a, a plant that would be really helpful for the skin. Sage? No? This one's called Molin, and it's a plant that is also really soft. It has a lot of little fibers on it. You can see the dew on it. It's one that I like to have kids pet, too, because they get excited about how soft it is. And this plant is a really great lung tonic. So it's helpful for people who have been exposed to smoke or who have been smokers. It's helpful for if you've been around a lot of mold or pollution. It helps to repair um, the tissue of the lungs. And this is one that, with all the, like in fire season, we usually make, we make a lung tonic tea um, and often sell a lot of mold into other herbalists too, just to kind of prep people for fire season too. And it puts out a big, beautiful stalk of yellow flowers in its second year that the bees also really love. Is this, yeah. Is that not native to California? It's not native to California. Mullen is native um, to Europe, but has kind of it grows wild here. It was brought over with colonialism, and is yeah, you can often find it wild, or in people's gardens. Yeah, but this plant here is native to California. Does anyone know this one? Yeah, this is yarrow. And this is the medicinal variety, the, the white flowers here. Um, Achilles millifolium is the Latin name for it. And this is the only medicinal variety. Often you'll see in people's yards kind of like a terracotta or a pink yarrow or an orange one, they're really beautiful, but they don't have as many medicinal properties. And this one um, is native to here. It also grows in a lot of different continents all over the world. It's one that's easy to find in a lot of countries and in a lot of different herbal traditions. This one, again, is also super antiviral, antibacterial, so it's good for a cold or a flu. Um, it can also bring on a, help break a fever, bring on sweat, too. And the, the leaves are really great for stopping bleeding. So Achille, uh, Achillea millifolium being the Latin, it's coming from the story of Achilles. Um, and the thought was like that his wound was, was covered with these leaves because these leaves are aseptic, they'll stop bleeding. So if you're ever on a hike, um, and this one grows wild around the Bay Area, and you cut yourself, um, 
you can kind of chew up the leaf and put it on the skin and it'll help to stop the bleeding and it'll also help to prevent infections. And in general, it's interesting, it also helps to break up stagnant blood in the body. It's really helpful for bruising. Um, it can also bring on menstruation. So it's one of those interesting herbs that can kind of like, it knows what to do. It knows if it should stop the bleeding or bring bleeding on. And a lot of these plants, as you've noticed probably, they have a variety of uses, right? So there's some things like mullein, which is mostly just for the lungs, but a lot of them have like 15 different uses. Um, and those are just the ones that I know about and probably folks working in other herbal traditions probably know 15 other uses. So these plants are really, are both holistic in the way that they work inside of our bodies, but they themselves have a lot of different properties. And this one kind of spiritually, energetically, yarrow is really helpful for boundaries too. So for people who have a hard time saying no to others or kind of like feel a little bit like they kind of like merge or blend with other people, don't know where they start and someone else start, stops, um, yarrow can be helpful for that too. And I'll have some clients where I'll put like a little bit of yarrow in someone's herbal formula. And the next time I talk to them, they're like, I said no to my boss and I broke up with my boyfriend and <laughs> like had to talk with my landlord and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, Yarrow, Yarrow helped in there. Um, so I think that's the last slide. Can leave it up there. So in talking about how might you use these plants, um, on the market right now you can often find um, herbal medicines in a few different forms. One are tinctures which are alcohol and water extractions of plants. You can sometimes find um, glycerin extractions instead if you don't want to use something that's alcohol-based. But they're really potent extracts of the plants. And they often come, I have some in the back, but they often come in little like brown bottles that you can find at a health food store. And you either put a few drops under your tongue or in water, and most bottles will say the dosage on them. Um, and the great thing about tinctures is that they're portable, you could take them with you anywhere, you can just put them in your bag, um, and they have a really long shelf life. They usually last from between eight to 10 years, so if you buy one and you don't use it right away, that's fine. Um, and people often, we tend to sell more, of, more tinctures than anything else at Steadfast, because I think it's pretty, it's a lot more like an over-the-counter drug or a pharmaceutical, and that there's not that much work, right? You're just kind of like taking it as you need it. Um, so it's a good entry point for people. Um, another form is to get teas. And I think that there's something really great about making teas just because they take time. Um, but that's also what often prevents people from, from making teas, is the, the little bit more time and energy that's required. Um, and you can find herbal teas um, at health food stores. And tea bags are great, um, but they're not usually as strong as what I'm talking about when I'm talking about herbal tea preparations. Uh, usually you're going to use more plant matter and you're going to steep it for a long time. So um, if you have a cup of chamomile tea, that's great. That's going to like be a little bit calming and soothing. But if you make a strong infusion, um, then it's really going to help with anxiety. It's really going to help with fear, help with ADD, all of these other things. So you're usually going to make a little bit stronger of a tea than a tea bag. But again, whatever you have access to is great. So if you have tea bags, give them a try. And um, a little tip I like to tell people is that those chamomile tea bags, which are kind of one of the easier herbs to find, like most diners will even offer chamomile tea, um, is they're really great for any kind of eye issue. Um, so if you just soak, if you have a sty or an eye infection or anything like that, you just steep that tea bag in hot water and then you can use it, um, let it cool, don't burn your eye, um, but then you can put it on the lid of your eye or in your eye and that really helps to heal up any kind of eye infection really quickly. So um, that's, chamomile is something that people often have access to and it's often overlooked because it's such a common um, form of herbal medicine, but it's actually a really powerful. It's a really strong anti-anxiety um, medicine, and it's also helpful for infections, too. 
that's one thing to know about. So you can take teas. You can also, you, as I was saying before, you don't have to ingest plants too to experience um, plant medicine. You can also, you could put some sprigs in your bath if you take baths. Um, you can make a foot soak if you don't have access to a bathtub. Uh, you can also carry a sprig in your pocket. Um, and again, just being around the plants themselves can be really helpful. So the way that I was trained and the way that I work with people is it's really about building a relationship with the plants to get the most out of it. So if you just like in this short little slideshow, we're like, I need that plant and I need that plant and I need that plant, which is often people's reactions because we're all in need of a fair amount of support. Um, I would really encourage you to start with just a few plants. And again, to like maybe make, make a tea if you're really drawn to yarrow. Also just to follow your gut and your intuition too. So if you're really interested and curious about yarrow, I would like make a tea with it every day or take the tincture every day for a while before introducing another plant. Um, just to have a sense of like, how is this affecting my body? There's like what it says in a book or it's what I might be saying up here, but then there's your own experience too. So getting knowledge from your own body, um, from your own mental and spiritual state, how is this affecting me? So also spending time with the plant too can be really helpful if you're lucky enough to have access to plants in your day to day. And I don't know much about Cupertino, I don't know much about this area, but um, often community gardens, if there's any community gardens here, will have medicinal plants, like community gardens that are focused on raising vegetables or community garden projects, and they'll have medicinal plants just sort of like to attract butterflies and bees and things like that, but no one's really using them or spending time with them, so that's often a source too. Um, yeah, so I encourage you to like both think about, you know, do you come from your own herbal tradition too? Are there people that you can ask in your family about the herbs that they used um, to try to revive some of those traditions? Um, or also just kind of like follow your gut of what plants that you're most drawn to. Yeah, and I wanna leave plenty of time for questions too. Um, and I just ask that if you have a question, just think about is there maybe someone else in the room who might be holding the same question too? And if there's something like very, very specific, feel free to email me or talk to me afterwards. Yeah. I think we're going to go to ask questions. We're going to go to this microphone here. Yeah. Um, I think it's for filming. Yeah. Testing. <laughs> Great. Is there a, um, an herb that would be good to create more oxygen in the blood. Mm. Will you speak more to what the underlying concern is? My brother has full lung capacity. Everything is completely healthy, mm -hmm. but only 40% of the, um, there's only 40% oxygen going into his, um, uh -huh. into his blood. And they don't, they can't figure out why. They cannot. Um, that's a good question. There isn't an herb that's coming to mind right now that would be helpful for oxygenation. Um, I can think about it if you want to take my email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good afternoon. I missed most of your parts. I'm very sorry. But could you tell about the hibiscus tea, what we get in the market? Oh, the any, hibiscus any tea. Any advantage or anything we are missing or... Uh -huh. Do you have any special thing about the hibiscus? Hibiscus, yeah. yeah. Hibiscus is a really great herb. Um, it's help, it, it does contain, contain a good amount of vitamin C, so that's one benefit. But it's also super cooling, so, and it's hydrating. So it's helpful if you know you're going to go into a situation where you might get overheated or you might get dehydrated um, to make it beforehand to have it available or if you're in that state of feeling um, really dehydrated or overheated, you could do a hibiscus tea for that. Yeah. And my second question is that I have here a list of books. Uh -huh. 
and you mentioned about a tincture and that. Which book you recommend for a beginner, you know, that, okay, I have this disease or this, uh -huh. this issue, I should go for this, you know, because yeah. for a layman, you know, in a busy life in Silicon Valley, you know, nobody has time to read the book completely. Uh -huh. Which one is the... You know, I haven't looked book at that. for dummies, you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I haven't looked at that specific book list. Um, that's one that Clara put together. But on the yellow sheet, um, there are some book recommendations for me. Yeah. Um, and of those that I can speak to, The Gift of Healing Herbs, I like that book a lot because it's mostly, it's someone who's been in clinical practice for like 30 years. And she's mostly telling, giving the information via story which for me is a, is a helpful way to um, integrate things, is to reading and story format. Um, what, you're, what you're asking about is called, it's kind of called a materia medica, so it's basically like, this herb is good for this, this herb is good for that. Like you, I have a headache. Yeah. Okay, then I can say, my wife, honey, you take this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Simple, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Most, Istamar, yeah. Uh, the common thing, you know, otherwise you will go to. Yeah, so the, um, the kitchen, the Kitchen Herbalism book, that is also in that yellow sheet, that one has half, half of it is recipes with herbs that are easy to find, and the other half is, basic, is a Materia Medica, where it lists, um, it lists herbs and the conditions that they treat. So that would be a good starting place. And yeah. for now, my last question is that any plants which are poisonous, which we are growing in the home, so we have to uh, be careful, you know, should yeah. we take inside, should we put on the kitchen, should I touch my leaf? I read some article, but I think I'm talking to a specialist, and so yeah. we are growing many plants, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes somebody gives, sometimes we buy, sometimes we love it, right. sometimes it is cheap. So please tell us which are the poisonous plants, mm -hmm. which are only good for oxygen, but not for... Yeah, I would say in general, don't ingest a plant unless you know um, what its properties are, just to be safe. Um, and there are things like, there are some poisonous plants that people grow ornamentally a lot of the time, um, like ornamental nightshades, like datura. There's plants like that that you definitely wouldn't, oleander even, that you wouldn't want to ingest. Um, so I would say generally, but if you have some oils on your hand, you're probably okay. Um, I would say just don't ingest something unless you know what that plant is and what its properties are. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. And the most poisonous plant that grows wild that a lot of people don't know about, it grows definitely in Pescadero, where I am, kind of everywhere, is a poison hemlock. So people sometimes mistake it for like, um, for wild carrot. It has that look to it, but it's one that's like the deadly hemlock that Socrates supposedly had to take. Um, so it's, that's like one of the most poisonous plants that we have growing around, but there's not a lot that are as poisonous as that. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> Do you have any recommendation for something to improve vision? To improve vision? Yeah. Um, it kind of depends on what's going on for you too. Um, Eyebright is a herb that's sometimes used for eye conditions and people will do eye washes with it so you can actually get a little like cup in a natural food store where you basically make a tea and you kind of wash your eye in it um so chamomile and eyebright are two herbs if it's something that's structural it's going to be hard to work with it with herbs if it's about the shape of the eye um that's going to be something that's harder to treat with herbs yeah how would you process the dandelion root? Mm, mm -hmm. So you could either, um, so you wanna wash it and chop it. And if you wanna make tea, you could dry it, either if you have a food dehydrator or you could put it in your oven on low um, and dry it that way. And you can then put it in a glass jar and, or a plastic bag and save it for tea. If you wanna make a tincture of it, you could kind of look online like how to make a tincture but you basically chop it and put it in alcohol um, for a month and then strain it out. It would be the simplest way to do it. Yeah. Hi, um, is there an herb that you would recommend for inflammation and arthritis? Yeah, so inflammation as it relates to arthritis or just inflammation in general? Uh-huh. 
Um, one of the great anti-inflammatory herbs out there is turmeric. It's super anti-inflammatory. It's really helpful for arthritis specifically. Um, and with turmeric, you can get some good quality fresh turmeric too on the market. You can also get tablets of powdered turmeric, like capsules. Unfortunately, you kind of need to get the expensive ones. So if you go to a health food store and you see turmeric capsules, um, I would get the higher grade ones that might be a little bit pricey, but they'll be a lot more effective. I haven't tried the gummies. Have you tried the gummies? Were they helpful? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Another folk herbal remedy that I read about recently for arthritis is taking a little bit of apple cider vinegar every day and water. Um, I think with honey as well. Um, that that is a, a folk remedy that some folks find to be effective. And then also just using topicals for the pain, um, like a CBD salve um, is one that's generally the strongest. Uh, we also we have a salve that also has mugwort in it and comfrey and hops that, can, that people have said has also been helpful for their arthritis. So kind of treating it topically to relieve some of the pain. But turmeric is one of the best ones to take internally. Yeah. I, I had um, some comments and a question. Yeah. Um, you were speaking about turmeric, which I take. It's mm -hmm. helped me a lot with pain in my hip. <clears throat> and um, I had a friend that was buying it bulk from a really cheap source. Uh -huh. And I warned the friend that you have to be careful that you're buying it from a trusted source where it's been tested for mm -hmm. lead and arsenic. Yeah. Um, it's worth it to pay the extra money for things that have been tested. Yeah. And I usually look that for that on the label when mm -hmm. I'm buying things. Um, and then um, another thing for things that I grow at home, there used to be orchards where I live, so I still don't know what's in the soil, mm -hmm. even though I don't spray things. Yeah. So for things that I'm going to consume, you know, I'll buy pots. You can use buckets and drill the mm -hmm. holes in the bottom, and then I buy good organic soil and grow it on those, mm -hmm. so I'm not introducing something into my diet. Yeah. So that leads to my next question. Is there a place where you can send things, I'm interested in the teas I drink, mm -hmm. to be tested um, for lead, arsenic, and other things that isn't prohibitively expensive? Do you like, know um, like teas that like you've already lab? purchased? Yeah, a lot to of get them I can't tested. find information um, I on don't, the teas themselves. Yeah, I don't know of laboratories to send to you. I would say it'd be a matter of like sourcing it from places that you trust in the first place. Um, I think that generally Mountain Rose Herbs is one of the bigger suppliers and Pacific Botanicals those are two um, kind of large scale suppliers in the US that are organic and they have good reputations. They are okay. doing a lot of Im importation like I was speaking to, okay. um, but they also will say what has been, Pacific Botanicals themselves grow, a lot of what the herbs that they sell, they grow and they say on their catalog awesome. what they've grown okay. and what they've grown organically. Okay. All right, yeah, because I, I drink a lot of tea, mm -hmm. and I love good English tea, but I quit drinking it and switched oh, like to, black... Numi, to Numi or Mighty Leaf because mm -hmm. I know that they're tested. You're, you know? you're speaking to, like, black tea yeah, or caffeinated black tea. Teas, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I types don't, of teas. I think, that, I think that Mountain Rose does maybe sell black tea. Okay. Or, awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Very nice of you. What is the best way to dry and restore the herbs? Dry, what is the best way to dry and store the herbs? Um, there's a few different methods you could do, like that you're harvesting from your own garden, um, is that you could, you could kind of, you can make like a drying rack that's basically um, a, a picture frame that has like screen material on it and you can hang it there. Or you can take basically a hanger and with clothespins just dry the herbs that way. Um, what other way, whatever way it'll have like good airflow, good circulation, and then you want to dry them out of the direct sun. Sometimes people get confused because they think I want to dry the thing. The fastest way to dry it is, is to put it in a sunny window, but that will actually um, take some of the nutrients and the properties out of the plants. So it's good to do it in like a dark place. Um, sometimes people use food dehydrators on a low setting or even in your oven on like a super low, like warm setting, 
you can put the herbs on a sheet and, and dry them that way. And then store them, like glass jars are best if you have them, or Ziploc bags too. Um, you could, just anything that is like airtight, they're gonna keep the longest that way. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for your talk. It was yeah. really interesting. Um, I had two questions. Are there any herbs that you recommend for blood pressure that increases due to stress? And mm -hmm. for the second one is uh, reversing the grayness of hair. Like, um, like uh -huh. there are some, like people who have grayness, they have it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, if the graying is induced by stress, yeah. specifically, is there, are there any herbs for these two conditions? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, Motherwort is a really great herb for lowering blood pressure. It's a heart tonic and it's an anti-anxiety. Um, and it's one specifically that's good for um, blood pressure that, that spikes when, when stress is happening. Um, it's a really lovely plant too. It also kind of gives a sense of being like, it's a motherwort, it's like sense of being held too. Um, so it's a really lovely one that I work with a lot. And I would say with the hair loss, I don't know of a specific herb or the grain of the hair. I don't know of a specific herb that will prevent grain. I would say more just like there's a lot of herbs that help with stress and anxiety in general. And that's what the workshop I'm going to be doing next month here is about, is, about, is we're just going to talk in depth about eight herbs, including motherwort, um, that are really helpful for stress and anxiety. And are there any um, herbs that you'd recommend for reducing the um, anger, irritability, uh, like low patience levels? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, chamomile is actually a really great one for that. Um, it's good for like kids who are tantruming, but it's also good for adults who are doing their own version of having a tantrum. Um, it just like is very soothing and really good for um, general irritability. Um, I think milky oats, too, is a nice one for that. Um, the oats, the picture that I showed, it's just, it's just like a soothing, calming tonic that can kind of ease things overall. And, and in a tea form rather than tinctures? And um, with milky oats, tincture is actually the best. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I just have a question I couldn't understand. For the blood patient, mother? M a mother wart. It's... Yeah, you would take it as a tincture or a tea. It's really bitter, so it might be hard to take as a tea um, just because of the taste, but you could also take it as a tincture. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much. It's a great talk. Um, I have a question. Do you have any herb that you recommend for um, um, bronchial asthmatic condition triggered by like smoke or something, like for example, mm -hmm. lately with all the fires? You know, I have some condition which is triggered by smoke. Yeah. So is, is there any herb or something you can do, you know, preventive basis? Mm -hmm. um, the, the mullein that I talked about is one that can be really helpful for that, um, for helping, helping if you know that you're exposed. Um, and it's one that you can kind of take daily too to prevent asthma attacks as much and to help heal the lungs themselves. There's some herbs that are more helpful for like acute situations. I wouldn't necessarily tell someone to not use their inhaler, um, but there are some herbs that can kind of have a similar effect. But they're a little, like one of them is lobelia, which if you take it in higher quantities, you'll vomit. So it's one that you wanna be pretty careful about and just doing really low quality quantity. And it's um, kind of hard to find on the market for that reason. But that is one that if someone's feeling an attack coming on can be useful. Um, elderberry, like I showed, is one that has an affinity for the lungs. So using that can sometimes be helpful too. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. You. How to detox your liver, kidney, your internal uh -huh. organ without Fasting? Could you, do you yeah. have any herb besides like a yeah. milk thistles and dandelion green? Yeah, the milk thistle is a great herb for the liver. Dandelion root, burdock root. 
roots. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a tea out of it? Yeah, you can find roasted dandelion root tea that's actually really delicious. Yeah. People sometimes use it as a coffee substitute. Um, or burdock, you can eat it, you can make yeah. food with it, or you can make a tea of the root. Um, milk thistle, either like cook, you know, sprinkling milk thistle on. Is it milk thistle seed? Seed. Or, how about the plant? Itself? Just the seed itself seed. is the part that's used. Yeah, you can find a milk thistle tincture. We can find kind of like milk thistle sprinkle. Those are all really good herbs for tonifying the liver. Um, I have really mixed feelings about fasting. I think yeah. that, yeah, it's too much for a lot of people. Um, so doing more like gentle, nutritive foods. Like, uh, like for two, three cups a day or h how often? Yeah, I would say if you're really, I would say, yeah, maybe two cups a day. And with the roots, you want to, um, instead of just pouring hot water over them, you actually want to simmer them in the hot water because they're harder to break down mm -hmm. than leaves. So you're going to simmer them for about 20 minutes, a half hour to get all the medicine out of them and drink them that way. Thank you. And how to uh, lower the inflammation? How to, lo how to lower inflammation? Yeah, 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 yeah. we were just talking about turmeric being a really great one. Uh, turmeric root oh, turmeric. being a really good one. And you could mix that in with the herbs that you're simmering. So if you have like burdock root and dandelion root on the stove, um, ginger is anti-inflammatory too. Ginger. You could put ginger and turmeric in there and then that would be a delicious tea. Uh, and it would also help with the liver and help with inflammation. And do you have a classes in do the future for how to grow your herb? Yeah, we teach classes at Steadfast. So if you go to steadfastherbs.com, our website, the first, I think it's on the first page, there's a point where you could put in your email and we'll add you to our list. We only send emails like four times a year, five times a year, not a lot, um, but we announce when we have classes. And so we, um, yeah, we'll be teaching some at the farm in Pescadero. Good. Good. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. You're Very welcome. Helpful. Thank yeah. you. I was going to ask about visiting your farm in Pescadero, mm -hmm. but I guess is it best just to go online and read about? Um, yeah, we occasionally have um, like open house work days. We're part of a, uh, we sublease from a larger farm called Root Down Farm, which is a meat farm. And there's another, um, there's also a veggie and flower growers there. So okay. we're not open to the public because there's a lot of really cute baby animals. Right. And we would never work because everyone wants to tour the baby animals. Um, so it's, it's closed to the public, but there are, we do have work days. Probably we're going to start to have them once a month in the spring and summer uh, where you don't have to work. If you, you, know, you can just come and see uh, or we're open for workshops too. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. Um, I grow echinacea, but mm. mostly because I just love the flowers. Yeah. And, and um, I was told uh, that just for tea, just to use the root, mm -hmm. but I don't generally want to have to dig up my yeah. nice flowers because they usually last about, they keep coming back for uh -huh. about usually five years. Is that, or should I just read up on it or? Yeah, do you, you can actually use the leaf and flower for medicine as well. It's just not as strong as the root. Okay. But, it, but the root, people usually wait three years to use the root. So right now we use, at Sadfast, we use the flower and the stem. Oh, um, do you? For making tincture and it's really, it works really well. It's very effective. I would just make sure what kind of echinacea it is because some are medicinal and some are hybrids that aren't medicinal. Oh, so echinacea purpurea is the kind that's medicinal. Purpurea. Yeah, so okay. it kind of has the like um, pinkish, purplish flowers, and the cone is kind of orangish, pinkish. Yeah. Um, that's the kind that's medicinal. Okay. And the other ones are more ornamental. Okay, good to mm -hmm. know. So you, you could like kind of take a picture, look online at pictures. But I have to say in general, like anything um, online is not always the best information source. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sometimes people will just kind of like copy paste from each other's like medicine blogs and things like that. We're like, oh, yeah. who came up with this in the first place? And now it's repeated. Um, so I would definitely cross reference, like you can use it for IDEAN somewhat, but I would like cross reference it with a published book. Oh, okay. It's my recommendations for Good books. To know. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever grow turmeric on your farm? We I tried, just... it really likes the heat. And we're in the oh. coastal fog. Oh, yeah. So 
we want to try to make a bed inside of the greenhouse to grow it, but so okay. far, no luck. We have a friend in Tennessee who's been growing it for us, Yeah, uh, which has been really great. But, oh, okay. I'm mm -hmm. just curious because I was thinking about growing it. Yeah, I you was, could give it a try. Yeah. I'm so glad you told us about the yarrow because I have pink and yellow mm. just because I like the colors. Uh -huh. I have a little bit of white, but I never even thought about which was more medicinal. Yeah. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. So some of the white. This is really interesting. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Volunteers, yeah, we're going to start to have uh, more regular work days, volunteer work days, probably once a month. Um, so if you sign up on our, uh, the email list online, then we'll send out announcements about the work days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll have like lower impact, ha you know, we'll have like gentle weeding or seed planting tasks to like digging. We'll have a whole spectrum and also people are welcome. They'll also just kind of be open houses where people are welcome to just walk around to you and have access to the garden. Yeah, we're not certified organic because getting certified organic is a very expensive and lengthy process, but we use organic practices. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. One, yeah. um, the Blackberry Farm here in Cupertino, uh, you should check with the, the rangers there because I do believe they have herbal gardens there that you might mm. be able to get herbs. Um, one of the questions I had is uh, as a hiker, uh -huh. uh, bay leaves are very common. Did, yeah. Is there any particular advantage to using bay and making a bay tea? Yeah, um, bay, especially California bay, is very strong. Um, so it's one that I've used mostly just as a steam. So if you have like clogged sinuses, mm -hmm. you can put it in a, like pour boiling water into a bowl, crumple up some bay leaves, um, put your face under a towel over the bowl and y you'll get that steam um, to help with the congestion. I know that it's a plant that the Ohlone and some other native nations did use medicinally. And it's one that I don't have a lot of familiarity with, aside from the like aromatics of it. Right. Yeah. Uh, then the last thing is, uh, what types of things do we have to actually worry about interactions, negative interactions between the drugs or, yeah. or with pharmaceuticals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so most of the most of the herbs that are more on the food spectrum, when I was talking about that spectrum, um, are safe to use with pharmaceuticals. With other things, you do want to look. So. I think that, I don't, unfortunately, a lot of businesses don't do this. On our tincture bottles, we'll say contraindications, which just means don't take this if you're on this medication or don't take this if you're pregnant or have low blood pressure. Um, but most books will also tell you that. So if you're getting a book on herbalism, it'll say, you know, this plant is good for this, 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 and don't use it if blank. Um, because herbs are real <laughs> and they do work. And so they are working on a physiological level that could be interacting with a pharmaceutical or a condition in a negative way. So that's a really good point to bring up. That's important to do a little bit of research first. Um, yeah. So one last question. Um, a lot of times it's just, you know, you have coughing and, you know, um, and that sort of thing. Is there mm -hmm. anything to get, get that clear? Yeah, an expectorant to help get it out. Yeah, there's a number um, of herbs that are expectorants. I believe thyme is, when we were talking about thyme. Um, that's one that can help you to cough things up. Um, it also depends on, like, do you have phlegm in your lungs and, like, what color is it? It can be, like, that specific. Um, but if you have like wet, clotty phlegm, um, something that I recommend is called elecampane root is one that we grow that's really nice um, for helping to get things out. Um, steams, like I was talking about, can be helpful for that too. So if you did like a eucalyptus or a bay leaf uh, steam, yeah. For diabetic patients, do you have any suggestions? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? For diabetic patients, 
Do you have any suggestions? For which issues? Diabetes. Diabetes. Yeah. Um, diabetes is a challenging one. It's one that I would like, it's, I would more work with someone one on one around that, around regulating. Um, burdock can be helpful uh, because it helps to regulate the blood sugar levels and it's a gentle, it's a gentle food herb. Um, so burdock is one that I would say, but other things I would, I don't feel comfortable speaking to right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to understand uh, what the source of this information is and how it's been tested. Um, uh, in the sense, there are several traditions that, as you say, have mm -hmm. come from, uh, that plant medication has come from, but uh, I wanted to understand this specific list that you've uh, told us about today. Yeah. Um, what tradition is it part of? Yeah. If any, and, and whether it's also gone through the um, testing with any science as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So the plants that I was talking about and the way... Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, kind of what herbal tradition am I coming from? Like when I was talking about these plants and their uses, what knowledge am I drawing from? What herbal tradition am I coming from? And also has, ha, um, has this information been tested by science? So the, way, the ways that I've been trained are both, are kind of in two different schools. Um, one is Western herbalism, which is kind of just a term for like a conglomeration of things, but it was kind of came out of the 70s. There was two main herbalists, Rosemary Gladstar and Michael Moore, not the filmmaker, but um, the herbalist Michael Moore. They um, kind of did a little bit of a revival in the US, um, kind of when the back to the landers around kind of European herbal. It was like herbs from European continent that had come over with colonization, as well as some study of plants that were native to the US. And so that's kind of been combined into this idea of Western herbalism. And then my teachers, Karen and Sarah, uh, they're, they're practicing energetic herbalism, um, which comes partly from Karen is Choctaw, and she was raised by her elders in, into plant medicine. So it's partly coming from her tradition um, as a Choctaw person, and also a little bit combined with Western herbalism. And the understanding of energetic herbalism is that the mind, body, and spirit are all really interrelated, which is true in a lot of different traditions. Um, and so, and to also use kind of like low dosages, like use the lowest effective dose um, to meet your needs. So those are like the two trainings I have. And in terms of whether things have been tested, um, some plants have been studied a lot and some plants haven't. There's also herbalists who are like really amazing like science geeks and like follow all of the research and like know the studies and the papers and can tell you the phytochemical of each plant. And I am not that person. I, <laughs> science was like not my forte. Um, so I don't necessarily, I, I can't give you all that information, but there are some plants that have been really studied. St. John's wort is one, um, in part because it's contraindicated with so many medications and it became really popular in the 90s. So that's one that there's like a ton of studies on. Echinacea is one that there's a lot of studies on. Elder is one. There's like this study that came out of a hospital in Israeli about how it's more effective than the flu shot. Um, that, of course, it depends on which flu shot gets made that year. But um, so there's some plants that have, but there's just not a lot of money and research for this. And, and so like, and also talking about how a lot of pharmaceuticals, like 40% are derived from plant material. Like they're obviously doing the research on those plants to, to extract that constituent, make that compound. Um, but whether that's publicly accessible, that kind of research, I don't know. And I think the universities aren't really studying it that much. Yeah. I know you mentioned you have a section on this herbal education. So w what do you recommend as the next steps in terms of learning more? Yeah, um, the, well, that radio show that I talked about, Herbal Highway, is a great way if you just want a free 
educate, you know, access a podcast, some really great free herbal education, that would be a good place to start. Um, checking books out of the library. And then I put in there some places where you can take just like one workshop or a weekend workshop. Um, they're all more like East Bay, so they're a little bit far from here, but I'm, there's, I'm sure that there's people practicing and teaching uh, in Silicon Valley as well. Uh, so I would just do a little bit of research. Often like Eventbrite is where people will post classes and workshops. So if you just search like herbalism on Eventbrite, and your area, probably things would come up. What is lavender for? What is lavender for? Um, lavender is super antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal. So it, it comes from the word to wash, the Latin. Um, so it's often used for cleaning things. It's also really helpful in stagnant depression, too, um, to kind of like also wash out the mind a little bit. And it can be calming for some folks, and it can be actually a little bit stimulating for other people. So there's kind of this idea that like lavender is always calming, and I don't think that's true for everybody. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's another common plant that you can, that's all over the Bay Area. Yeah. Are there any other folks who want to ask some questions? I just wanted to ask for a friend that had to leave early. Um, do you have any experience with, with amla or moringa uh, from that's used in Ayurvedic yeah, <laughs> medicine? Moringa? Yeah, moringa. It's used in a lot of different traditions. Um, I have a neighbor and coworker who I, who's from Oaxaca, and he he gave us a plant, and it's used. From he says it's like not like a cure all, but it's used for like a lot of different conditions. It's not one that I was trained in or that I'm super familiar with, but it does show up in a lot of different ancestral traditions, um, and I think is used for a lot of things. But I, I'm personally not educated in its uses. And, and Alma, have you heard of that? No, I haven't heard of that one. Right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, what, would you feel comfortable saying what Moringa is used for? Uh, we use them as vegetables. Uh-huh. We use them in stew and soup. For any specific medicinal reason or just for eating? Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to speak. Something that I meant to say earlier, too, was just that um, people will sometimes ask me about the placebo effect. Um, which is a real thing. Like when they're doing drug trials, um, it kind of, you know, they're accounting for the placebo effect affecting a lot of people. So I think that that's true. I also think that herbs have phytochemicals that have been proven to, you know, can be proven in the labs or via science to have a physiological effect on the body. Um, but I think that that's kind of only like half the medicine of the plants too. I think that if you could call it placebo or not, but I think that also when people have the intention of caring for themselves or their loved ones with herbal medicine, if you, if you like buy a tincture for your anxiety and then you remember to take it when you're feeling anxious, there's also a medicine in that and like choosing in that moment to support yourself in that way or handing that to someone and somebody else being supported by someone that they love giving them medicine, like that is also part of the process too. Um, and it's interesting, like as someone who didn't grow up with plant medicine, like this is, you know, I've been doing this for 12 plus years and sometimes I'm still like, I have to like, sometimes I question as well because it's, I, there's a lot of um, kind of training that I have to overcome around these things. But people will come up to us at the farmer's market and be like, it's the strangest thing. I like bought your sleep support tincture and then I've been sleeping really well. Like, I don't understand it, you know? And you're like, well, because you have been using the sleep support tincture and it works. Um, so if you're not, if you're like lucky enough to like grow up with herbs in your life and to know their power, that's awesome. But if you're new to this, like it is, there is a little bit of a learning curve or it can take somewhat, like a while to um, believe in that if that wasn't the belief system that you were given. So just wanted to say that too. 
Yeah, so at Southwest Herbs, we're at three farmers markets right now. We're at the Santa Cruz one on Wednesdays. We're at the Ferry Plaza Farmers Market in San Francisco on Saturdays and the Berkeley Farmers Market on Saturdays. And we're gonna try to do the San Mateo Farmers Market next season as well. So those are the farmers markets we're at. We also have an online store too, for, um, so people can get things that way as well. Yeah. So the, um, so yeah, so steadfastherbs.com if you wanna sign up for our newsletter. Um, if you want to learn about workshops or work days, they're on the business card back there. And also my, my personal business card for working with clients one-on-one -on -one is back there as well, too. And if you go to my website, you can also just like email me a question. If you had a question but you didn't feel comfortable asking it in front of others, feel free to um, send me your question and hopefully I can answer it. All right, thank you.